Hello。咁啊，讀你聽，繼續遠大前程啊！咁啊，故事嘅第五節啦。咁啊，上回講個邊咧？上回咧就係啦。有冇地食飯？又佢嗰個姐夫係咁 upgrade 俾佢咯。係點解啊？系咁不 gravy 俾边个啊？系点解俾系咁不俾阿主角阿 Pip 啊？因为佢佢支持佢啊。系啊，佢锡阿 Pip 啊嘛。咁<笑>但系发阿 Pip 受到啲咩唔好嘅事情咧？唔好嘅对待。嗰啲人话佢唔知咩。系啊，话佢话佢咩？话佢唔生性咯。佢家姐喺啲人面前喺度数佢不是咯。即係大大小小嘢，即係可能有啲嘢係抵死嘅，但係好即係總之數數落佢啦，啊話佢好要你家姐含辛茹苦湊你，你又唔聽話咁咯嚇，即係嗰啲嗰啲即係嚇今時今日就係嗰啲嗰啲廢佬會講嘅嘢咯嚇咁咯，咁啊有啲咩人咧？咁啊有啲係教即係教會嘅代表啦嚇，有啲係社會各階層，啲應該都係啲比較誒。呃叫做點講啊？叫有少少身份啦，少少啦，因為都唔係都唔係咩，都唔係啲咩大人物，叫有少少有少少 status 嘅人啦。即係譬如有個係神父啦，係嘛？有個咩 Mr. Mr. Wopsle 啦，跟住有 Hubble 兩夫婦啦，仲有咩 Uncle Pumblecook 啦 ？Uncle Pumblecook 就誒。欸應該係佢親戚嚟啩，即係醫院房親戚啩。咁都係清一色，都係阿 Pip 唔中意佢哋，即係覺得誒、欸、你哋咩都唔知，就喺度批評。雖然佢係小朋友，但係都好唔中意佢哋。咁阿阿姐夫啊，只能夠不嘢俾佢，不 gravy 俾佢，不不不不到好多咁啊。咁啊，呢個係作者描寫手法啦。咁一直去到幾時咧？就係、是、一直去到阿 Pip， 其實都一開始坐立不安啊，即係覺得佢做咗鬼心事啊嘛，偷咗屋企嘢食出去俾人，啊偷咗個工具出去。咁一直去到邊咧？佢又覺得係啦，就係佢家姐話：，誒、哎，我攞個批俾你，我整咗個鹹肉批俾你哋食啊！咁咪去攞咯，係咪？咁大家都好期待啦，食個鹹肉批。咁啊～阿 Pip 就再再頂唔順啦，即係其實佢唔出聲冇人知，但係佢啱啱俾人咁數完，係嘛？咁佢家姐嚇話係佢嘅都唔出奇，係不過總之佢就係作賊心虛啦，咁佢頂唔順啦，咁佢就決定離開啦。咁啊離開屋企，咁啊走啦，咁啊點知咧道門一開就有啲士兵企咗喺度啦。咁士兵嘅話咩啊？就係、是、話啊，你喺度係嘛？嚟啊！咁樣咁其實佢話 Here you are, look sharp, come on。係啦，跟住仲有一個咧，就係拎咗一對手扣出嚟俾佢。咁究竟係咪嚟捉佢咧？似乎就唔係嘅，因為如果嚟捉呢個小朋友就唔需要有啲士兵嚟嘅啊。咁但係俾讀者嘅感覺就係、是、哇，做乜事啊？咁啊 ，Pip， 如果俾阿喺阿 Pip 嘅角度就嚇到雲飛魄散啦，應該。嗯。好唔好啊？明唔明啊 ？OK， 咁我哋繼續講落去咯喎，睇下 Pip 同嗰個士兵會出現啲咩狀況啦。佢話 ：The apparition of a file of soldiers ringing down the butt ends of their loaded musket on our doorstep caused the dinner party to rise from table in confusion. And caused Mrs. Joe, re-entering the kitchen empty-handed, to stop short and stare in her wondering lament of, "Gracious goodness, gracious me, what's gone with the pie?" The surgeon and I were in the kitchen when Mrs. Joe stood staring. At which crisis, I partially recovered to use of my senses. It was the surgeon who had spoken to me, and he was now looking round at the company. With his handcuffs invitingly extended towards them, 
in his right hand and his left on my shoulder. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, said the surgeon, but as I have mentioned at the door to this smart young shaver, I am on a chase in the name of the king and I want the blacksmith. Oh, you know how you joke a blacksmith, well, dear, dear fool. And pray what might you want with him, retorted my sister, quick to resent his being wanted at all. Mrs. returned the gallant surgeon, speaking for myself, I should reply, 停一停先，哎，继续讲啦。And pray what might you want with him, retorted my sister, quick to resent his being wanted at all. Mrs. returned the gallant surgeon, speaking for myself, I should reply, the honour and pleasure of his fine wife's acquaintance. Speaking for the king, I answer, a little job done. This was received as rather neat in the surgeon, in so much that Mr. Pumblecook cried audibly, "Good again!" You see, blacksmith said the surgeon, and my surgeon is sergeant, who had by this time picked out Joe with his eye. We've had an accident with these, and I find the lock of one of them goes wrong, and the coupling don't act pretty. As they are wanted for immediate service. Will you throw your eye over them? Joe threw his eye over them and pronounced that the job would necessitate the lighting of his forging fire, and would take nearer two hours than one. Will it? Then will you set about it at once, blacksmith? Said the offhand sergeant. As it's on His Majesty's service, and if my men can bear a hand anywhere, they'll make themselves useful. With that, he called to his men. Who came trooping into the kitchen one after another and piled their arms in a corner, and then they stood about as soldiers do now, with their hands loosely clasped before them. Now, resting a knee or a shoulder. Now, easing a belt or a pouch. Now, opening the door to spit stiffly over their high stocks out into the yard. All these things I saw without then knowing that I saw them, for I was in an agony of apprehension. But beginning to perceive that the handcuffs were not for me, and that the military had so far got the better of the pie as to put it in the background, I collected a little more of my scattered wits. Would you give me the time? said the sergeant, addressing himself to Mister Pumblecook, as to a man whose appreciative powers justified the interfere the inf the inference that he was equal to the time. It's just gone half past two. That's not so bad," said the sergeant, reflecting. "Even if I was forced to hold here nigh two hours, that would do. How far might you call yourselves from the marshes hereabouts? Not about a mile, I reckon. Just a mile," said Mrs. Joe. "That will do. We begin to close in upon them about dusk. A little before dusk, my orders are. That will do." "Convict, sergeant," asked Mr. Wopsle in a matter of course way. I returned the surgeon. Two, they're pretty well known to be out on the marshes still, and they won't try to get clear of them before dusk. Anybody here seen anything of any such game? Everybody, myself excepted, said no with confidence. Nobody thought of me. Well, said the sergeant, they will find themselves trapped in a circle. I expect sooner than they count on. Now, blacksmith. If you're ready, His Majesty the King is. Joe had got his coat and waistcoat and cravat off, and his leather apron on, and passed into the forge. One of the soldiers opened its wooden windows, another lighted the fire, another turned to the bellows. The rest stood round the blaze, which was soon roaring. Then Joe began to hammer and clink, hammer and clink, and we all looked on. The interest. Of the impending pursuit, not only absorbed the general attention, but even made my sister liberal. She drew a pitcher of beer from the cask for the soldiers and invited the surgeon to take a glass of brandy. But Mister Pumblecook said sharply, "Give him wine, ma'am. I'll engage there's no tar in that." So the surgeon thanked him and said that as he preferred his drink without tar, he would take wine if it was equally convenient. When it was given him. He thanked His Majesty's health and compliments of the season, and took it all at a mouthful and smacked his lips. Good stuff, eh, surgeon? Said Mister Pumblecook. I'll tell you something, returned the surgeon. 
I suspect that stuff's of your providing. Mr. Pumblecook, with a fat sort of laugh, said, I? Why? Because, returned the surgeon, clapping him on the shoulder, you're a man that knows what's what. Do you know, said Mr. Pumblecook, with his former laugh, have another glass. With you, hop and knob, returned the surgeon, the top of mine to the foot of yours, the foot of yours to the top of mine. Ring once, ring twice, the best tune on the musical glasses. Your health. May you live a thousand years and never be a worse judge of the right sort of never be a right never be a worse judge of the right sort than you are at the present moment of your life. The surgeon tossed off his glass again and seemed quite ready for another glass. I noticed that Mr. Pumblecook, in his hospitality, appeared to forget that he had made a present of the wine, but took the bottle from Mrs. Joe and had all the credit of handling, of handing it about in a gush of jovial, joviality. Even I got some, and he was very free of the wine that he even called for the other bottle, and handed that about with the same liberality when the first was gone. As I watched them, while they all stood clustering about the forge, enjoying themselves so much, I thought what terrible good sauce for a dinner my fugitive friend on the marshes was. They had not enjoyed themselves a quarter so much before the entertainment was brightened with the excitement he furnished. And now, when they were all in lively anticipation of the two fillings being taken, and when the bellows seemed to roar for the fugitives, the fire to flare for them, the smoke to hurry away in pursuit of them, Joe to hammer and clink for them, and all the murky shadows on the wall to shake at them in menace as the blaze rose and sank and the red-hot sparks dropped and died. The pale afternoon outside almost seemed in my pity, pitying young fancy to have turned pale on their account. Poor wretches. At last, Joe's job was done and the ringing and roaring stopped. As Joe got on his coat, he mustered courage to propose that some of us should go down with the soldiers and see what came of the hunt. Mr. Pumblecook and Mr. Hubble declined on the plea of a pipe and lady society. But Mr. Wopso said he would go if Joe would. Joe said he was agreeable and would take me if Mrs. Joe approved. We never should have got leave to go, I'm sure, but for Mrs. Joe's curiosity to know all about it and how it ended. As it was, she merely stipulated, if you bring the boy back with his head blown to bits by a musket, don't look to me to put it together again. The surgeon took a polite leave of the ladies and parted with Mr. Pumblecook as from a comrade, though I doubt if he was quite as fully sensible of that gentleman's merits under arid conditions, as when something moist was going. His men resumed their muskets and fell in. Mr. Wopso, Joe and I received strict charge to keep in the rear and to speak no word after we reached the marshes. When we were all out in the raw air and were steadily moving towards our business, I treasonably whispered to Joe, I hope, Joe, we shan't find them. And Joe whispered to me, I'd give a shilling if they had cut and run, Pip. We were joined by no stragglers from the village, for the weather was cold and threatening, the way dreary, the food bad, darkness coming on, and the people had good fires indoors and were keeping the day. A few faces hurried to glowing windows and looked after us, but none came out. We passed the finger post and held straight on to the churchyard. There we were stopped a few minutes by a signal from the surgeon's hand, while two or three of his men dispersed themselves among the graves and also examined the porch. They came in again without finding anything, and then we struck out on the open marshes, through the gate at the side of the churchyard. A bit of sleet came rattling against us here on the east wind, and Joe took me on his back. Now that we were out upon the dismal wilderness where they little thought I had been within eight or nine hours and had seen both men hiding, I considered for the first time, with great dread, if we should come upon them, would my particular config suppose that it was I who had brought the soldiers there? He had asked me if I was a deceiving imp, and he had said I should be a fierce young hound if I joined the hunt against him. 
Would he believe that I was both imp and hound in treacherous earnest and had betrayed him? It was no use asking myself this question now. There I was on Joe's back, and there was Joe beneath me, charging at the ditches like a hunter, and stimulating Mr. Wopsle not to tumble on his Roman nose and to keep us and to keep up with us. The soldiers were in front of us, extending into the pretty wide line with an interf- with, with an interval between men and men. We were taking the course I had begun with, and from which I had diverged in the mist. Either the mist was not out again yet. All the wind had dispelled it. Under the low red glare of sunset, the beacon and the gibbet and the mound of the battery and the opposite shore of the river were plain, though all of a watery lead colour. With my heart thumping like a blacksmith at Joe's broad shoulder, I looked all about for any sign of the convicts. I could see none. I could hear none. Mr. Wopsle had greatly alarmed me more than once by his blowing and hard breathing. But I knew the sounds by this time and could dissociate them from the object of pursuit. I got a dreadful start when I thought I heard the file still going, but it was only a sheep bell. The sheep top stopped in their eating and looked timidly at us, and the cattle, their heads turned from the wind and sleet, stared angrily as if they held us reasonable for both annoyances. But except these things. In a shudder of the dying day, in every blade of grass, there was no break in the bleak stillness of the marshes. The soldiers were moving on in the direction of the old battery, and we were moving on a little way behind them. When all of a sudden we all stopped, for there had reached us on the wings of the wind and rain a long shout. It was repeated. It was at a distance towards the east, but it was long and loud. Nay, there seemed to be two or more shouts raised together. If one might judge from a confusion in the sound, to this effect, the sergeant and the nearest men were speaking under their breath. When Joe and I came up, after another moment's listening, Joe agreed and Mr. Wopsle agreed. The sergeant, a decisive man, ordered that the sound should not be answered, and that the course should be changed, and that his men should make towards it at the double. So we slanted to the right, and Joe pounded away so wonderfully that. I had to hold on tight to keep my seat. It was a run indeed now, and what Joe called, in the only two words he spoke all the time, a winder or a winder, down banks and up banks and over gates and splashing into dikes and breaking among coarse rushes. No man cared where he went. As we came nearer to the shouting, it became more and more apparent that it was made by more than one voice. Sometimes it seemed to stop altogether. And then the soldiers stopped. When it broke out again, the soldiers made for it at a greater rate than ever, and we after them. After a while, we had we had so run it down that we could hear one voice calling "murder," and another voice "convicts, runaways, God, this way for the runaway convicts." Then both voices would seem to be stif- stifled in the struggle, and then would break out again. And when it had come to this, the soldiers ran like deer, and Joe too. The sergeant ran in first. When we had run, the noise quite down, and two of his men ran in close upon him. Their pieces were cocked and levelled when we all ran in. Here are both men," panted the sergeant, struggling at the bottom of the ditch. "Surrender, you two, and confound you for two wild beasts come asunder." Water was splashing, and mud was flying, and oaths were being sworn, and blows were being struck. When some more men went down into the ditch to help the sergeant and dragged out separately, my convict and the other one, both were bleeding and panting and execrating and struggling. But of course, I knew them both directly. Mind," said my convict, wiping blood from his face with his ragged sleeves and shaking torn hair from his fingers. "I took him. I give him up to you. Mind that. It's not much to be particular about," said the sergeant. It will do you small good, my men, being in the same plight yourself. Handcuffs there. I don't expect it to do me any good. I don't want it to do me more good than it does now," said my convict, with a greedy laugh. I took him. He knows it. That's enough for me. 
The other convict was livid to look at, and in addition to the old bruised left side of his face, seemed to be bruised and torn all over. He could not so much as get his breath to speak until they were both separately handcuffed, by leaned upon a soldier to keep himself from falling. Take notice, guard. He tried to murder me. Were his first words. Try to murder him," said my convict disdainfully. "Try and not do it. I took him and give him up. That's what I done. I not only prevented him getting off the marshes, but I dragged him here, dragged him this far on his way back. He's a gentleman, if you please, this villain. Now the hulks has got his gentleman again through me. Murder him. Worth my while too to murder him when I could do worse and drag him back." The other one still gasped. He tried, he tried to murder me. Bear, bear witness. Look here," said my convict to the sergeant. Single-handed, I got clear of the prison ship. I made a dash and I done it. I could have got clear of these deaf cold flats likewise. Look at my leg. You won't find much iron on it. If I hadn't made the discovery that he was here. Let him go free. Let him profit by the means as I found out. Let him make a fool of me afresh and again once more. No, no, no. If I had died at the bottom here, and he made an emphatic swing at the ditch with his manacled hands, I'd have held to him with that grip that you should have saved to find him in my hold. The other fugitive, who was evidently in extreme horror of this of his companion, repeated. He tried to murder me. I should have been a dead man if you had not come up. He lies," said my convict, and with fierce energy, "he's a liar born, and he'll die a liar. Look at his face. Ain't it written there? Let him turn those eyes of his on me. I defy him to do it." The other, with an effort at a scornful smile, which could not, however, collect the nervous working of his mouth into any set of expression. Looked at the soldiers and looked about at the marshes and at the sky, but certainly did not look at the speaker. Did you see him? Pursued my convict. Do you see what a villain he is? Do you see those scrawling and wandering eyes? That's how he looked when we were tied together. He never looked at me. The other, always working and working his dry lips and turning his eyes restlessly about him far and near, did at last turn them for a moment on the speaker with the words, "You are not much to look at." And with a half-taunting glance at the bound hands, at that point my convict became so frantically exasperated that he would have rushed upon him for the interposition of the soldiers. Didn't I tell you? Said the other convict then, that he would murder me if he could. And anyone could see that he shook with fear, and that there broke out upon his lips curious white flakes like thin snow. Enough of this parley. Said the surgeon, "Light those torches." As one of those soldiers who carried the basket in lieu of a gun went down on his knee and opened it, my convict looked round him for the first time and saw me. I had alighted from Joe's back on the brink of the ditch when we came up, and had not moved since. I looked at him eagerly when he looked at me, and slightly moved my hands and shook my head. I had been waiting for him to see me that I might try to assure him of my innocence. It was not at all expressed to me that he even comprehended my intention, for he gave me a look that I did not understand, and it all passed in a moment. But if he had looked at me for an hour or for a day, I could have, I could not have remembered his face ever afterwards, as having been more attentive. The soldier with the basket soon got a light and lighted three or four torches, and took one himself and distrib- distributed the others. It had been almost dark before. But now it seemed quite dark, and soon afterwards very dark. Before we departed for the spot, four soldiers standing in a ring fired twice into the air. Presently, we saw other torches kindled at some distance be- behind us, and others on the marshes on the opposite bank of the river. All right," said the sergeant. "March." We had not gone far when three cannon were fired ahead of us with a sound that seemed to burst something inside my ear. You are expected on board," said the sergeant on to my convict. "They know you are coming. Don't straggle, my man. Close up here." The two were kept apart, and each walked surrounded by a separate guard. I had hold of Joe's hand now, and Joe carried one of the torches. Mister Wopsle had been for going back, 
but Joe's was resolved to see it out, so he went on with the party. There was a reasonably good path now, mostly on the edge of the river, with a divergence here and there where a dike came, with a miniature windmill on it and a muddy sluice gate. When I looked round, I could see the other lights coming in after us. The torches we carried dropped great blotches of fire upon the track, and I could see those too, lying, smoking, flaring. I could see nothing else but black darkness. Our lights warmed the air about us with this pitchy blaze, and the two prisoners seemed rather to look to like that as they limped along the mist in the midst of the muskets. We could not go fast because of their lameness, and they were so spent that two or three times we had to halt while they rested. After an hour or so of this traveling, we came to a rough wooden hut and a landing place. There was a guard in the hut, and they challenged, and the sergeant answered. Then we went into the hut, where there was a smell of tobacco and whitewash, and a bright fire, and a lamp, and a stand of muskets, and a drum, and a low wooden bedstead, like an overgrown mango without the machinery, capable of holding about a dozen soldiers all at once. Three or more soldiers who lay upon it in their great coats were not much interested in us, but just lifted their heads and took a sleepy stare, and then lay down again. The surgeon made some kind of retort, uh, some kind of report, and some entry in the book. And then the convict, whom I call the other convict, was drafted off with his guard to go on board first. My convict never looked at me except that once. While we stood in the hut, he stood before the fire, looking thoughtfully at it. Or putting up his feet by turns upon the hob and looking thoughtfully at them as if he pitied them for their recent adventures. Suddenly, he turned to the surgeon and remarked, "I wish to say something respecting this escape. It may prevent some persons laying under suspicion longer than me. A longer me. You can say what you like," returned the surgeon, standing coolly, looking at him with his arm folded. But you have no call to stay in, to say it here. You have opportunity enough to say about it and hear about it before it's done with, you know. I know, but this is another pint, a separate matter. A man can't starve. At least I can. I took some whittles up at the village over yonder, where the church stands most out on the marshes. You mean stole? Said the surgeon, and I'll tell you where from. From the blacksmiths. Hello. Said the surgeon, staring at Joe. "Hello, a pip," said Joe, staring at me. "It was some broken window. It was some broken whittles. That's what it was. And a dram of liquor and a pie. Have you happened to miss such an article as a pie, blacksmith?" asked the surgeon confidentially. "My wife did at the very moment when you came in. Didn't don't you know, pip?" So said my convict, turning his eye on Joe in a moody manner and without the least glance at me. So you're the blacksmith, are you? Then I'm sorry to say I've eat your pie. God knows you're welcome to it. So far as it was ever mine, returned Joe, with a saving remembrance of Mrs. Joe. We don't know what you have done, but we wouldn't have you starved to death for it. Poor miserable fellow creature, would us, Pip? That. The something that I had noticed before clicked in the man's throat again, and he turned his back. The boat had returned, and his guard were ready. So we followed him to the landing place made of rough stakes and stones, and saw him put into the boat, which was rowed by a crew of convicts like himself. No one seemed surprised to see him, or interested in seeing him, or glad to see him, or sorry to see him, or spoke a word. Except that somebody in the boat growled as if the as if to dogs, "Give way, you!" Which was the signal for the dip of the oars. By the light of the torches, we saw the black hulk lying out a little way from the mud on the shore, like a wicked Noah's ark, cribbed and barred and moored by massive rusty chains. The prison ship seemed, in my young eyes, to be iron like the prisoners. We saw the boat go alongside, and we saw him taken up the side and disappear. Then the ends of the torches were flung hissing into the water, and left out, and and went out, as if it were all over with him. Gong Yun, um, 比较长啦、啊，呢节都系因为佢佢觉得佢要话晒俾你听，由呢一班士兵入屋到到佢哋出屋
，到到佢哋去捉呢兩個疑犯，到到捉到，捉完送佢翻去個哨站，再由哨站，即係佢哋個佢哋有個有個有個 station 咁啦，即係好即係好噏得嘅啫。然之後喺個 station 度，仲要送佢上船。送去邊隻船啊？送翻佢嚟嗰隻船咯，就係嗰隻專係再返嗰隻船咯。嗯、即係成個過程講曬，一次一口氣一個 chapter 要交代曬。咁、嗯、説明咗咩？説明咗呢個反似乎都唔係啲咩重點。唔關事。係即係同阿 Pip 似乎都唔係有啲咩好重要嘅關係。但係我想講呢一節係刺激嘅，對我嚟講係刺激嘅，因為。你企喺阿 Pip 嘅立場啊嘛，嗯、即係一來就係佢哋要去捉個疑犯啦，你唔知佢哋會係咪戇居居咁行落去？唔係喎，佢哋行行咁上，佢哋要跑嘅喎、哦。然之後有人喺度嗌：，哇、啊！佢哋嗰度，佢哋嗰度，又又睇唔清楚前面，因為好多好多霧啊，咁睇唔清楚。即係你切身處地喺嗰個環境咧，係幾刺激嘅。尤其是阿 Pip， 因為你又你又擔心，你又想去捉到佢，你又唔想去捉到佢。嗯然之後你又驚你捉到佢，佢又會篤你出嚟，因為話你係厭仔、啊、所以個個心情係複雜而刺激嘅。而作者就已經喺第四節、第五節呢啲咁嘅位就已經捧咗呢樣嘢出嚟啦，即係唔係好常見嘅嘅展開咯，嚇、啊、唔算好常，即係佢由一個一個細路仔喺屋企食下派啫，偷下嘢啫，搞下搞下笑啫，但係去到呢個位。跟住啲士兵去捉人，即係嚇，即係幾刺激嘅，去到呢個位度嚇。咁、嗯啊、然之後最尾個反就真係篤咗佢出嚟喎。我食咗啊，我食咗你個批啊。嗯、但係點知佢個姐夫神回覆喎，佢話：，唉、哎，我哋都唔想你餓親，你食咗咪好咯。你明白？跟住個反就吹佢